What is going on, New York Giant fans? Welcome back to another edition of the Big Blue in the Bronx podcast. Hit that like button for me, comment, and subscribe. Turn on post notifications so you know when a live stream pops or a video drops. Appreciate you coming back. Share out. Do all the good stuff. We appreciate you guys for all the stuff you have done for us this year, 2023. We really appreciate it. And next year is going to be even better. Uh, we got another game two preview, of course. It is the Rams-Giants game. All the usual segments. We have Jake Ellenbogen, who we've had on the channel before. He is a Rams content creator. He knows a lot of different people in that community. And, of course, he gives us a great perspective in the second half of the show. But what is the outlook on this game? What are the first thoughts on this game? Well, obviously for the Giants, it doesn't mean much of anything, right? You talk about meaningless wins, meaningless games overall, uh, the way other people look at it. You look for the Rams, it's pretty much a different story. The Giants, obviously, you know, the intention is to win every single game and every single season, you know, obviously you play to win. That's the Herm Edwards quote. Obviously, Brian Dable would like to abide by that. And obviously, we know that there's a quarterback change in the building, which obviously I talked about on the last uh, podcast episode. And I kind of knew that they were going to make a change at quarterback because, you don't sit there on Monday or Tuesday and say, yeah, you know, uh, we, we don't have a decision yet. That means you're going to change the quarterback. Like I have never seen a franchise say that and say, okay, now we're going to stick to uh, the same quarterback. So it'll be Tyrod Taylor this week. And for the Rams, they're 8-7. and seven. This is a crucial game for them. This is a crucial game in the instance of making the playoffs. The Rams... When we were in the playoff race against the Packers and all these other different teams, they were our biggest threat to make the wild card. Now that we're not in there anymore, they have multiple other teams that they need to kind of beat out. There's a, you know, obviously high chance that they make the playoffs, but if they lose this game, it's it's not very high. Right now, they're the sixth seed. They have the tiebreaker over Seattle, but they have the Vikings, they have the Packers, they have the Falcons contesting that spot as well as the New Orleans Saints. Uh, currently, Tampa Bay leads the NFC South, so they're not the leaders. So it's going to be really, really interesting to see what happens the next two weeks with the Rams. But this game, they have to win by all means. And be I bet this, right? I bet it. Sean McVay is going to have these guys coached up on game day because he is one of the best coaches in the NFL. Talk about the Belichicks, the Andy Reeds, McVay is working his way up there because he has his team ready every Sunday. Now, 8-7, and seven, that's not the best record in the league. That's not the best record in their division. But they have some decent talent. And one thing I'll say with the Rams is this, right? And Jake talks about it in the second half of the show, but it's essential to being an NFL GM. They hit on a lot of their late-round guys. Alaric Jackson was like a 5th, 6th, 7th-round pick, and he's their starting left tackle. He replaced Andrew Whitworth. Uh, Kyron Williams was a sixth-round draft pick out of Notre Dame. Ben Skoranek was a late-round pick, maybe even undrafted uh, free agent out of Notre Dame. You talk about Puka Nokua, who was the biggest one. Fourth, fifth-round pick out of BYU? I believe so. You have to give credit where credit is due to this Rams organization and this Rams coaching staff for coaching these guys up. And, you know, obviously the Rams aren't the perfect organization, but I would like the Giants to maybe take a hint into their scouting to see how they hit on these guys and coaching, of course. So let's talk about the injury report. The Rams, well, Joseph Noteboom with a foot injury. He is questionable. Puka Nakua questionable with a hip injury. Late on the injury report, though, did not practice on Friday, practiced the first two days. Illness for Ernest Jones, which would be a big loss, but I think he'll play. Questionable for Sunday. Also, same thing for Alaric Jackson, a thigh injury, so that would be big. Um, did not practice, but maybe it's a cautionary thing of, hey, don't practice on Friday, um, and then we'll get you in for the game. That could be the situation, but again, uh, this is a scenario where the Rams need every single one of their players, and also Trey Tomlinson, the rookie out of TCU, did not practice all week. He is out with a hamstring injury. As for the New York football giants, Deontay Banks is questionable after being limited in practice with a shoulder injury. Lawrence Cager is doubtful with a groin injury, and Dexter Lawrence is also 
actually, is Dexter Lawrence questionable? He is not questionable. He's actually not even on the, well, he didn't have a final injury designation, which means he's going to play in one. Though Robinson uh, limited in practice on Friday and Wednesday with a quad injury. I think he'll play. So that is the injury report. Going to 2023 team stats, the Rams, they're pretty balanced in most areas. I'm not going to lie to you. Seventh in total yards, start with offense. Tenth in rushing and tenth in passing. Ninth in points per game defensively, 18th in total yards, 22nd against the pass, 13th against the run, and 19th in points per game. 19th in pass percentage and run percentage on first down, pass percentage just by itself. And 9th in run percentage, excuse me, 9th in pass percentage on first down, and 14th in run percentage on first down. 17th in blitz percentage, 28th in pressure percentage, and 28th in sacks. So they really don't get to the quarterback a ton compared to some of these other teams in the NFL. And you would think Aaron Donald kind of has a little bit more of an impact. I'll give you a little spoiler here. He's only got something like six sacks on the season. Of course, sometimes that's not all in the stat sheet. It can be administered in the film room, too, to where he's impacting certain plays. Um, you know, obviously the pressures are a big thing as well. As far as the Giants go, they are 32nd in total yards and passing offense. They're 15th in rushing offense and 31st in points per game. Defensively, 28th in total yards per game, 20th against the pass, 29th against the run, and 27th in points per game. 21st in pass percentage, 12th in run percentage and run percentage on first down, and 29th in pass percentage on first down. Second in blitz percentage, 21st in pressure percentage, and 31st in sacks. Things to look for. Let's go into that, right? I'm going to say more blitz from Raheem Morris. This team can model what the New Orleans Saints did against Tommy DeVito and the New York Giants offense just, what was it, two weeks ago? Something along those lines. They could model that. And honestly, defensively, kind of similar teams in one aspect. They really can't get to the quarterback other than maybe a guy or two. It's mostly the six-sack area where three guys hover around Aaron Donald, Byron Young, and I think his name is Kobe... Hold on, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember his name right now. Kobe Turner, Kobe Turner. Those guys have around six, six and a half sacks each, and then it's just four and a half for two guys. I think Ernest Jones is one of them, and then it's another linebacker, and then it, it just goes down from there. But you know, a lot of Giant fans, and I also had the expectation against the Saints. Hey, this team does not really go um, get the quarterback well. They don't really sack the quarterback that often. In that case, can they have a, a good game? Can the Giants offensive line have a good game? They didn't have a good game. They gave up like six, seven sacks. And this could be the situation where Raheem Morris says, okay, we're going to send everybody because we really don't fear the receivers. We don't fear Tyrod Taylor as much as some of these other quarterbacks in the league. Now, you do fear Tyrod Taylor a little bit more than Tommy DeVito and maybe a little bit more than Daniel Jones. But Tyrod Taylor, you know, he's still going to have some pressure on his face either way, whether it's blitz or not, because... You do have Aaron Donald coming up the middle, and him against JMS, even if he's being triple teamed, Aaron Donald is still one of the best defensive linemen, interior defensive linemen at that in the entire NFL. I think the Giants are also going to be put in a situation where they could put a Dory Jackson in the slot, but I think you'll see some matchups where it's going to be Cooper Cup versus Cordell Flight. You saw two years ago, and I know this is a different philosophy, a uh, different game setting. But I think it was week five and 21 or week six, actually. It was week six and 21 where Jabril Peppers kept going up against Cooper Cup and he was getting sliced and diced. Um, I would like to think that that's going to happen with Cordell Flott a little bit. Same thing a little bit with Adoree Jackson because Adoree Jackson started out the year in the slot. I would like to think that's going to happen as well. And this team, I don't know how different their offensive philosophy is from the last time we played them. They could possibly run a few pick plays. Uh, that was very, very common uh, in the game against the Rams two years ago. One of them happened to be a fourth and one conversion for a touchdown. I think that went to Cup, if I'm not mistaken. But there's that. Triple teams of Aaron Donald. I think that's a big one, too. Um, you know, JMS, Justin Pugh, and Ben Bredesen. Those guys are going to be tasked to get Aaron Donald. And, you know, it's not a strong front that the Giants have. They don't, you know, JMS isn't that strong yet. Bredesen's not great. Pugh isn't great. 
So you could see some max protect from the New York Giants, and not for the edges, but for the interior, because they're going to be throwing four defensive linemen out there, including edge. It's not just going to be, oh, three-man rush and then drop eight back in coverage. I don't think that's going to happen. I think they're going to rush their regular four. If they want to blitz, they blitz. But in the four uh, down linemen or four you know guys, defensive linemen, two edge rushers and two defensive linemen, what they could do is you know max protect, put in Bellinger in there. And it would hurt the offense a little bit because you're going to have to force it to the wide receivers or rush out of the pocket, and it will take a tight end out of your target uh, perspective but essentially if you want to win this game and keep it close that's what has to be done and I think zone coverage could also be a part of Wink's repertoire it seems like he's gone on that a little bit more over the last few weeks the Saints game was that uh, the Eagles game was that and they have a lot of good targets a lot of underrated targets um, the St. Louis uh, St. Louis Rams Jesus Christ uh, the Los Angeles Rams they have a lot of underrated targets Kyron Williams Coming out of the backfield could be a little bit dangerous. Cooper Cup we already know about. Puka Nakua. Demarcus Robinson's had a nice few weeks here uh, with the Rams. So he is somebody that I would look to watch. And we're going to obviously head into players to watch. Matt Stafford. Over the last few weeks, he's had some really good games. Um, and I know he got injured earlier in the year with a finger injury against the Cowboys. And they got blown out. But he is a fighter. One of the toughest son of a bitches in the NFL. 14 games played this season, 62% completion. Not there in terms of completion, but 23 touchdowns. Doesn't even have double digit interceptions yet. One of the least sacked quarterbacks in the NFL, 3,648 yards. He's playing some of his best football, and you know he's going to turn it on against a Giants team that has nothing to play for, where the Rams team has a lot to play for in this situation. Uh, you go to behind him, Kyron Williams. Mentioned him, nine touchdowns, six runs over 25.1 yards per carry. Only one fumble lost this year and 1,057 yards. So he's going to be he's gonna be a tough guy to stop. You have to look at the defensive line to kind of, you know, make sure that he doesn't really uh, go off like some of these other running backs have. Uh, Bobby O'Karake, Micah McFadden, those guys are going to have to be trusted. And, you know, you, it even starts with a defensive line, not just Dexter Lawrence, but also uh, – you know, DJ Davids and Jordan Riley, those guys are going to get playing time. And, you know, as you start going into the later part of the year and you don't make the playoffs, you're going to be playing your seven string guys. Well, that's not really seven string, but your late round pick guys, your fourth, fifth stringers and all that sort of stuff, you're going to have to evaluate. And this is where the evaluation comes in. Can they battle against a semi-decent uh, interior? Like Avila's good. Dotson is one of the best. Um, that could probably be really credited to Ryan Wendell. And then Coleman Shelton's not great, so there's some manipulation you could obviously set there. Royce Freeman, their backup, two touchdowns, one run over 20, 317 yards, 4.3 yards per carry. So those are the only two I would worry about the rushing. Ronnie Rivers is also there, but he's only had 19 carries, played seven games. You take a look at the receiving core. Puka Nakua has over 1,000 yards in his first season. Five touchdowns, 1,327 yards, and 96 receptions. 24 plays over 20. That has to be something league-leading, um, or at least in the top echelon. Cooper Cup, 710 yards, four touchdowns. Remember, there was a little bit part there where I think he was on IR or at least injured. 55 receptions, 2-2 Otwell. He's had a better year this year. Three touchdowns, 476 yards, 37 receptions. If Tyler Higby, who's going to be factored in there, 433 yards, two touchdowns, 41 catches. Uh, two more for you guys. 20 receptions, 279 yards, four touchdowns, and six plays over 20 for Demarcus Robinson and Kyron Williams. 30 catches, 192 yards, three touchdowns, two catches over 20 yards. You take a look at the offensive line, you got Alaric Jackson, one sack, three penalties. Steve Avia, two sacks, two penalties. He's a rookie. Coleman Shelton, six penalties, two sacks, two penalties, four sacks for Kevin Dotson and Rob Havenstein, one sack, three penalties. You move forward to the defensive side of the football. You got Aaron Donald, 48 tackles, six sacks, 14 TFLs, 21 quarterback hits, 29 quarterback pressures. You got Byron Young, the rookie. I believe, I forget what college he's out of. It's not Alabama because that's the 
Byron Young on the um, Raiders. But anyway, Byron Young, 56 tackles, 6 sacks, 5 TFLs, 15 quarterback hits, 26 quarterback pressures. And Kobe Turner, who has 6.5 sacks, leads the Rams. 52 tackles, 6 TFLs, 12 quarterback hits, and 16 quarterback pressures. You move into the linebacking core, and of course, I will also go over this, the coverage statistics because I think that covering Darren Waller could be part of this game as well. You go to Ernest Jones, right? 132 tackles, 10 quarterback pressures, 4.5 sacks on the year, 13 tackles for a loss, 5 quarterback hits, and 6 pass deflections. In coverage, he's not terrible. No interceptions on the year, 65.9 completion percentage allowed, 1 touchdown, 89.1 passer rating, and 236 yards. Then you move to their second linebacker. That's going to be Christian Roseboom. And on the season, he's got 70 tackles. Also, some other stats for you. Two quarterback pressures, two quarterback hits, two TFLs. In coverage, a little worse than Ernest Jones. Uh, completion percentage of 83.3 allowed. One interception, one touchdown allowed, 90.3 passer rating. So something possibly to exploit. Then you go to a guy who they acquired from the Pittsburgh Steelers and he's turned into a really good ball player for them. Uh, that's Akello Witherspoon. A very low passer rating at 66.5. Four touchdowns allowed. Three interceptions. 44.7 completion percentage allowed. Then you go to the next three corners. Um, I'm factoring three because they like to rotate a little bit. I'll go to Darion Kendrick, who I believe is a second-year player. 59.7 completion percentage. One interception. Three touchdowns allowed. 91.9. Uh, passer rating. Then you go to Kobe Durant, who's got you know the same amount of years as Darion Kendrick. One touchdown allowed, 94.7 passer rating, 55.6 completion percentage, no interceptions. He's got seven starts under his belt this year. And finally, we got Quentin Lake, who is the slot cornerback and, again, also drafted in the 2022 year, who's made his transition over to the nickel corner spot. 62.2% completion, two touchdowns allowed, 88.7 passer rating, which isn't bad. So before we get to top matchups, we got to bring up SeatGeek. They sponsor us. We thank them for it. That is your one-stop shop for tickets for games, concerts, and tailgates. $20 off with the promo code Big Balloon the Bronx. That is nothing abbreviated, nothing you know spaced out. Big Balloon the Bronx, name of the podcast, name of the channel. So let's go to top matchups, shall we? Top matchups, uh, Rob Havenstein versus Kayvon Thibodeau, or it could be Alaric Jackson versus Thibodeau. And I think Havenstein's a better tackle, in my personal opinion, than Alaric Jackson. And I think if you play Thibodeau on Jackson's side, there could be some pressure coming from that side, my personal opinion. I think Thibodeau could have a little bit of a good game here. I know he wasn't much impactful against the Eagles. The Saints was meh, but I would like to think that Thibodeau could have a very good game against Alaric Jackson, and of course, Jackson will win his battles. Then you move over to Jalen Hyatt versus Akella Witherspoon and Darion Kendricks. I still believe that Hyatt is the best skill-talented receiver on this team, and I think the Giants need to start getting him the football. There's been a lot of miscommunication the last few weeks in this Rams secondary. Not that they're great, not that they're bad, but there's been some miscommunication. Jalen Hyatt, I think, can exploit that if the Giants have the play calls. Um, I'll also take Wandale Robinson versus Quentin Lake. The Giants need to get him involved more. Him and Hyatt, man. These two are young guys, second and third round picks respectively in two different draft classes. You need to get both of them involved. Not Darius Slayton. If you want to involve Darius Slayton, fine. But he's not going to be, the, oh my God, he's going to be the future outside receiver of the New York Giants. No, 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 no. No, he's, he's good. He's solid. But we're looking at the future here. Darren Waller versus Christian Roseboom or uh, Ernest Jones. That's going to be a solid matchup. I think the Giants can exploit a little bit of that. Waller against the linebackers, especially with Tyrod Taylor's arm. If he could just, you know, cut out a lot of those missed throws that happened last week. JMS, Justin Pugh, and Bredesen versus Aaron Donald. That's going to be big. That's going to be really big. I mean, you might have some double teams. Also, some Max Protect, like I talked about earlier. But um, the triple team of Aaron Donald. So, yeah, we already know what to expect in some cases. Adore Jackson or Cordell Flott versus Cooper Cup. Uh, Adore Jackson hasn't had a good few weeks other than the pick six and a good play against A.J. Brown last week. So, this is going to be a big week for him. And Cordell Flott, too. You have to 
obviously look at that. He's had some decent games, but he also doesn't understand zone coverage very, very well. So if the Giants drop into zone against Cup and he misses an assignment, that could be a touchdown for the Rams, and this game might be over just as soon as it started. Puka Nakua versus Deontay Banks. I'm really looking forward to this matchup. I don't think it's going to be Banks versus Cup. I think it's going to be Banks versus Nakua. Two guys from the same draft class. I don't think they've ever went against each other because they're two separate conferences college-wise. But uh, Puka Nakua versus Deontay Banks. I'm looking for Banks to win a couple of these matchups. My personal opinion. And uh, Dexter Lawrence versus Coleman Shelton. Lawrence ain't going to be fully healthy. I don't think he's going to be fully healthy for the rest of the season. But if you can manipulate Steve Avia and Coleman Shelton a little bit, hey, listen, get to the quarterback any way you can. But let's go two keys to win. We always do three keys to win. Uh, Number one for me is cover the back end. I really don't say that a lot. It's more for me about getting to the quarterback, which obviously is a part of it, but cover the back end. These guys, um, you know, Sean McVay offense, he's going to get very creative. The Giants need to cover the back end and not allow the explosive play. If you have to play two high safeties, if you have to play zone coverage, do what you got to do, but don't allow any big explosive plays. Keep it all in front of you. If that's the zone approach, do it. Whatever you need to do. But no big explosive plays because that's what happened in 21 and we were out of that game as soon as it started. So cover the back end. Number two, I would say get some sort of offense going. Take advantage of the miscommunications that have been happening in the secondary. I'm not saying Raheem Morris isn't a good coach. He is a good defensive coach, great defensive coordinator for the Rams the last few years. Uh, With that being said, sometimes some things aren't fixed immediately and getting Jalen Hyatt and Wondell Robinson involved could very much take advantage of those, you know, missed coverages and missed opportunities in the secondary. And uh, eventually Darren Waller, too. You know, you want to get him involved a little bit more, and you don't really want those drops either. And number three, I would probably say turnovers, maybe. You know, obviously turnovers are a good part of the game and an essential part of the game at that. Why not? You know, make, I would say pressure Matt Stafford. Make him uncomfortable. He's been playing some really good football over the last few weeks. Make Matt Stafford uncomfortable. We know that this offense is very poor. Defensively, I expect more. So defensively, go ahead, pressure Matt Stafford, make him uncomfortable. So cover the back end, get something going on offense, and take advantage of these missed coverages. And number three, uh, get to Matt Stafford. My score prediction is Rams 27-13. I don't really see it being close at the back end, maybe the first quarter, but I think there will be a part where, you know, the Giants don't really execute on a certain drive. There's going to be some momentum killer in the game. But 27-13, let's send it over to the discussion with Jake Ellen Bogan, who is the founder of Downtown Rams. He's on Twitter, he's on YouTube, and also is a part of the Believe in Rams podcast. All right, so now for the discussion portion of the show, we have Jake Ellen Bogan, who we've had on the channel before uh, for Yankees talk, but this time it's Rams talk. Obviously, they're coming to MetLife Stadium to play the New York Giants. He is the host of the Believe in Rams podcast and was the founder of Downtown Rams. Jake, first question I'll ask, since obviously you're a Rams fan and I could lean on you as someone who represents the fan base really well. What is the fan base's reaction to this type of year where you guys are just hovering over 500 and fighting for a wild card spot? It's funny because, you know, coming into the season, I had them going 10 and seven. Um, I was very high on this team. Felt like if they got in the dance, they can do anything. I mean, really wouldn't be surprised if they won the Super Bowl. Wouldn't be surprised if they got knocked out in the first round. I mean, you know, but a lot of the fan base was tank for Caleb Williams. A lot of the fan base was saying this, this isn't a good football team. They have no depth. The offense isn't great. Um, Kyra Williams is not North starting running back, you know, things like that. So I think right now it's a mixed bag. I think there's some, you know, that are like, w- we should have more wins. Um, and I think there are some that, you know, probably the majority are like, I'm just so glad that we're playing meaningful football in December, especially after last year. But let's not forget the fact that they've won the Super Bowl two years ago. So it's, you know, you don't want to come off as like a spoiled child, you know? And I think that's, that's the thing. I've watched a lot of bad Rams football. Um, 
to know that like, okay, even if they're not going to be the top team this year, I, you know, just as long as you stay competitive and you have a coach like Sean McVay, you have a coaching staff that he's assembled, you have a Matthew Stafford, a Cooper cup, so forth. Um, you know, you're in decent shape to make some noise, especially in an NFL uh, season where scoring is way down. So, I mean, I make the argument, you know, the last six games or whatever, let's say they're scoring around 30 points per game. That is more, that holds more value and more weight in 2023 than it did when they scored 32 a game in 2018. Because 2018 points were, you know, people, you know, all sorts of teams scored a lot of points. Now, the last two years, we've seen a decline in scoring. So I think right now what the Rams have been able to do in balancing out their offense, um, I think it's just been key and critical. It's been huge, and it makes them one of the scariest teams in all of football right now. And if any fan wants to complain about being in this position, then that's their prerogative, but uh, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, got to be happy you know, just being over 500 and still in that playoff race. Uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I was looking at, this was before the Saints game for the uh, for the Giants. I was looking at the New York Times playoff predictor, and you could screw around with it a lot. I believe, at least according to them, the way I was configuring it, that the Rams were the biggest threat to the New York Giants playoff spot. Now, obviously, the Giants are not going to make the playoffs. I kind of knew that at the time, but I was just playing with, around with it to see. But um, you talked... For about two seconds about him, Sean McVay. Since the Super Bowl win in 21, 21, the 21 season, 2022 year, um, there was some rumors after the fact that he would retire or, you know, possibly go elsewhere or whatever the case may be. Um, is there any concern about the future or is it just keep going with the team currently as is? No, I, th I think Sean wanted to take some time to really think about it because to me, based on what I heard, it was either he's going to take a step back and it's going to be a hiatus or he's going for the next 10 years plus. And I, you know, I think that's why it was such a delicate decision because he really, I mean, we see, you know, you guys see it, Robert Sala on the sideline with the jets last night, you know, the guy just looks totally defeated. I mean, he, he has that just look in his eyes. You know, people say he's emotionless. He's not showing emotion. He gets the media coming after him. I disagree. I think, you know, his face says it all. I think he's showing emotion. His face is showing that he's absolutely defeated. He's distraught. He's depressed. Uh, that was Sean last year. I mean, Sean talks a little bit more, obviously, um, a lot more. Um, has, you know, he's more vocal and has, you know, more... Um, he shows his emotions, you know, but that was Sean McVay last year. It was a tough year, you know, to win the Super Bowl, and then you have all those expectations to get back there. And you go out, you sign Bobby Wagner and Allen Robinson, you still have Jalen Ramsey, you still have Leonard Floyd, you still have Cooper Cup, Matthew Stafford, so forth. Um, you get punched repeatedly in the gut and in the mouth. Uh, in front of your home crowd on banner night when you're you're hanging your your Super Bowl banner. Uh, the Bills come into your home in front of the national audience and curb stomp you. And then after that, you know, you have a bunch of injuries and you're just not really able to recover. And it's one of those seasons where, you know, I try to tell people this is why I really didn't think the Rams had any chance of, you know, I know Vegas had them at six and a half. I thought it was silly because the Rams were in every single game last year going into the fourth quarter except the Chargers game. Now, they won five games last year, but, you know, sometimes the NFL takes a little, you know, a ball to bounce your way and so forth. And it's like, depending on, you know, their luck, I mean, those games coming down on the wire and everything, you flip that and they could have easily been, you know, eight and nine or nine and eight, despite all of that. And this was the first real moment in Sean McVay's career where it wasn't just adversity. He was facing something he had never faced before. This team was officially bad. They have they were officially 5 and 12. They were below 500. They were the worst Super Bowl defending team of all time um because no team has has finished that poorly after a Super Bowl win. But he really had to figure out whether coaching was worth it. And I think the thing that saved it for him was when they went out and got Baker Mayfield. Um, it, it felt like he got 
you know, the joy of coaching back again. He wasn't just coaching backup quarterbacks and hoping for the best because uh, the offensive line had a bunch of third and fourth stringers. They had a guy who was on their practice squad in 2012 who was starting. Um, so yeah, fig- figure that out. So the point I'm making here is that McVay had it rough last year. Um, you know, kind of had to be like, all right, you know, I, I'm going to listen. I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out. I mean, I want to start a family. I have a wife, you know, I want to have a kid and, um, you know, burnout. Right. I mean, he has to figure out a better way to make sure he doesn't burn out. And he gets all these deals like, yeah, 25 million, 30 million, 35 million to go on TV. And he'd be stupid not to think about it, at least not, not at least to give it a look. Right. So I think that's really what it was. And he loves coaching. You know, he comes from a great football background. You know, um, his grandfather, John McVay, was a, a focal point in that 49er run, uh, the, the five Super Bowls. You know, I think what it comes down to is that Sean is here for the long haul. Um, but I think he knew they couldn't just go into this season with Jalen Ramsey at $20 million on the cab. They couldn't just go into the season paying all these guys. They had to try to start something new. They had to start, you know, bringing in the next era of Rams football, if you will. And they haven't quite done that yet because they still have, you know, your top heavy stars like Stafford and Donald and Cup. Um, But they're paying $75 million to guys that aren't on the roster right now. And they're nine and eight. So the fact of the matter is this, is that the Rams have been known as the team that, oh, they just, they went all in. They mortgage the future, which by the way, none of that is true. Um, you know, they were starting Eric Weddle two years out of retirement in the Super Bowl. I mean, let's not call it a super team. So, you know, the thing with them now is that Sean and company have found a way to win with a new model. They're not F them picks. They're not trading for Von Miller. They didn't do anything at the deadline. They got a lot of scrutiny because of it. They're winning with guys like Demarcus Robinson, who you will see this Sunday, number 15. He's turned into the number three receiver. He is giving them the same jolt of energy. I just put this video out. He's given the same jolt of energy, almost down to the exact total. And he'll probably pass him as OBJ in the Super Bowl season. Um, so he's, he's given them that energy off the, off the bench and now being a starter. Akella Witherspoon, another bargain bin signing just like Demarcus Robinson. You don't have a lot of cap. You're spending 75 million on guys not on the roster. Okay. Now you have to hit on those guys, right? They trade right before the season and get the right guard, Kevin Dotson, who was listed for most of the years, the number one offensive lineman, according to PFF. Um, he's been incredible and it's helped the offensive line. The thing is the Rams are winning with a bunch of Island and misfit toy type of guys. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. I'm high on them and there are Rams fans that would say they are household names, but for the rest of the NFL, the way the NFL media talked about these guys, like they didn't even know who Ernest Jones was. Ernest Jones made play after play in the Super Bowl his rookie year. So, I mean, that's on them. But the point I'm making is that they are now doing it again. And should they go to the Super Bowl and win it? I mean, this has got to be the most impressive coaching job we've seen in years. I mean, to to do what they did, yeah, you can say, okay, they went out and they got some big names and that was their model. F them picks, trade for Jalen Ramsey, trade for Marcus Peters, keep the lead, so forth. But that's not how it is now. And I don't know if they'll go back. They might, but this team didn't have a first round pick. They hit on Puka Naku in the fifth round. They hit on Kyron Williams the follow the the year before in the fifth round. You know, their Kobe Turner, a late third round pick, uh, has really turned on. You know, Byron Young has looked good. They have these young guys starting. I mean, you know, a sixth round pick last year who ran a four nine forty is their starting corner. You know, I mean, that's really what it comes down to is that they've just found ways to get value, ways to hit on these guys and. You know, to make a long story short, even though it's already pretty long, uh, that's the Rams in a nutshell. Yeah, and I was talking actually on a, on Thursday night about like scenarios about the Giants trading up for a quarterback and stuff, and what that relates has to what you're saying about this Rams team. 
and it's pretty open, at least the way I see it with Puka Nakua, Kyron Williams, and all these different guys, is uh, you got to hit your picks and you got to make your bones as a general manager in the late rounds. Like, you know, you talk about the first picks, first round picks, second round picks, all those different guys. Your foundation is set within the late rounds and sometimes in drafted free agents. And a lot of people really don't know that or don't pay attention to that. But um, also, by the, well, actually, no, it doesn't really have much relations. But anyway, uh, back to the subject. What are some strengths and weaknesses of this Rams team position wise? Yeah, you know, first off, Matthew Stafford is the best quarterback in the National Football League right now. Currently, over the last five, six games, there's nobody playing better football than him. So I would say that's a strength, right? A uh, guy can make any throw on the field. Um, he's getting the ball quicker, but he's more effective. Um, he, you know, and there are times where, you know, he'll do a little hezzy and, you know, I mean, he he's done, you know, with pump fakes and things like that, getting different arm angles. I mean, it's been impressive what Stafford's doing, to be honest with you. Um, Kyron, he's just the second best running back in the National Football League right now, behind only Christian McCaffrey. Uh, if they figure out how to get him going in the receiving game, um, he's going to be virtually unstoppable. Um, the the key there is that Sean McVay is is using the pass and run balanced, the most balanced offense I think he's had in his career, which should scare the daylights out of anybody. Um, wide receiver, very 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 strong there. They're four deep. Um, I mean, we saw what Ben Skoranek did. If, if you watched the Thursday night football game last year with Baker Mayfield going down the field against the Raiders, uh, Skoranek can play. He doesn't have to though, because they got Cooper cup. They got Puka Nakua. They got Tutu Atwell. They got Demarcus Robinson. They're in a really good shape. They're in such good shape that they traded Van Jefferson, a former second round pick earlier in the season. Just to the get Falcons, like, I think it was right. Yeah. Just to get him some opportunity. Cause he, he wasn't going to play anymore when Cooper cup came back. Um, it sucks because I'm a big Van fan and he's a good dude. I know him, um, you know, personally. So, you know, that, that sucked, but then, you know, tight end, um, I think they're solid at tight end. I'd say they're, they're way stronger at quarterback, running back, wide receiver. I think Tyler Higby's solid. He's been hurt most of the year. He's the best tight end in Rams history. Um, so there's that they lost Hunter long. Who's key in the blocking game, um, for the season. So, They've had a rookie, Davis Allen, stepping in. Um, they also have Bryson Hopkins, who's in a contract year. And then offensive line, I mean, I thought this was a weakness. I thought it might be a weakness. I, th I, I thought they'd be better. I didn't think they'd be this good. Um, Stafford has been sacked fewer than anybody in the league uh, in the last five, six games. Um, this team is in the bottom 10 in allowing pressures. That's a good thing. Not, you know, top 10 in not allowing pressures. Um, which is kind of hard to believe. They're not really penalized either. Very, you know, I, the discipline is there. Um, Ryan Wendell, the, the new, you know, coach they got, he played for the Patriots as a player, was on the Bills last year as an assistant offensive line coach. He's been huge. They also have uh, Mike Munchak, who's one of the best offensive line coaches, I think, in the game's history. Um, you know, they have him. Yeah, he's, still, he's still like an assistant with you guys? He is a consultant. I don't even know if he's on the books, but McVay never shies away from mentioning him and how important he is. So he Giant. definitely has a hold on him. I, I'll, I'll let you continue what you're saying, but I've been saying for the past year and a half that the Giants should absolutely break the bank to get him over here, but I'll let you continue. I am with you. I, I don't know how... Like, I mean, the Steelers, like, let him go, and he immediately went to the Broncos, and the Broncos' offensive line was great when he was there. So I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking, but, um, yeah, he's one of the best to, to ever do it, and I think everybody knows that. Um, then the defensive side of the ball, you know, you could say this is probably the, the weakest spot, but I think really what it is is that the beginning of the season, the the latter half of the season has been the offensive show, the first part of the season was the defensive. I mean, defense really had to keep them in games. Um, and, and now I think defense is playing a little bit more aggressive. So they're giving up more points uh, because the offense is, you know, okay. Now, you know, the offense is scoring close to 30 a game currently, um, not for the year, but currently like in the last five. So I think the defense is now trying to like, okay, I'll jump this route. I'll try to, you know, get a pick here or, or do something like that. And uh, earlier in the year, they couldn't because it was like, you know, man, if we give up 20, we lose this game. And that, that's a tough pill to swallow, you know? So I, I think that's that's been, you know, kind of huge there. 
Um, looking at the defense, defense line, great rotation. They got Bobby Brown. They got Aaron Donald. They got Kobe Turner. They got Jonah Williams. Um, you know, they use Laurel Murchison a little bit. They use Mr. Irrelevant, uh, Deswan Johnson. Not quite on the level of Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant, but still a good player in his own right. Um, so they got a lot of depth there. And that's saying a lot because they let Sebastian Joseph Day go two years ago uh, to the Chargers. Um, you know, and, and they let Greg Gaines go in, in free agency and Ashawn Robinson, who's now on the Giants. So, um, you know, they've let some really, really good players leave and they've done a nice job in replacing them. Linebacker, you could argue. Uh, Roseboom's solid. He's not like the best. Um, Ernest Jones is turning into one of the absolute best linebackers in the game. Um, it, he just continues to get better and better. He's number one in PFF graded linebackers uh, for the last five weeks. Um, he's the number one blitzing linebacker. That's another thing. Raheem is going to get after Tyrod Taylor. He knows that the the edge pressure isn't where it needs to be. And so he will send Ernest Jones and Ernest Jones gets in the backfield. Like it's, it's nothing. So um, that's a big thing there. That's a strength pass rush. I think when you, you look at them, obviously, you know, Byron on the third rounder, I thought he's, he's had a pretty solid season. Um, he slowed down a little bit. I thought he had a great start to the season. He slowed down a little bit. Michael Hoyt's playing good ball. They don't have a killer like a cave on Thibodeau. You know what I mean? They don't have that. So these guys are going to be solid. These guys are going to set the edge. These guys are athletic. They're going to, you know, if your quarterback tries to run, get to the outside, they will get over to them. Um, but this is not a team that has a dominant pass rusher. Um, not even a Leonard Floyd type. I mean, I think they got some good talent and maybe long-term Byron turns into that. But right now they don't have a Brian Burns. They don't have a cave on. They don't have a TJ Watt, a miles Garrett. They don't have any of that. So uh, Aaron Donald is where that comes from, from the interior. And then uh, the corners, uh, I think Akello's playing, you know, Akello Witherspoon, who they got in free agency. He's playing better than just about any corner in the league. I mean, he is, he is so good. Um, they ask him to do so many different things and he's just been outstanding. I think the safeties have been a little bit kind of inconsistent there. Um, you know, Kobe Durant ended up playing at, starting across from him against the Saints, but it was Darion Kendrick for the majority of the season. I don't know if they moved back to Kendrick, but I thought Durant played well last week and got screwed on that uh that last uh, touchdown there where they grab he grabbed this jersey. Uh, they didn't call it no big deal. They, they were going to win the game anyway. But I think when you you look at this Rams team, there's not a lot of weaknesses. I mean, you know, if you want to be picky, you could say, okay, the Rams could upgrade here, here, and here. But there's not a ton of weaknesses. Like if we want to get really picky, um, getting a franchise left tackle to to truly replace Andrew Whitworth might be more beneficial than having Alec Jackson. At the same time, I don't think Alec Jackson's playing bad. I think he's been pretty solid. The rookie, you know, Steve Avila left guard has played really good this year. The center, I mean, he's you know, uh, Coleman Shelton. I'd replace him. I'd I'd upgrade him. Not like that. I'm against him, but I think you could find a better starter. Uh, and then that right side is just, there's a reason why no team is running better to the right end than the Rams. Um, Kevin Dotson and Rob Havenstein are just absolute behemoths in the run game. And they, they're really good in the, in the, um, pass game as well. So, you know, I, I just think like, you know, people don't realize it because they look at the record and I think too often we look at that record and it's like eight and seven. Like it doesn't look sexy, right? I mean, you've, you lost seven of the 15 games you played. You've won eight of the 15. Doesn't sound great, but in a league like this right now where teams just really aren't pulling away, um, the Ravens 49ers feel like the only teams that really have kind of separated themselves from others. It, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if you get in the dance, you can win this thing. And and that's the thing. I think this is the most wide open season that we've seen in quite some time where, yeah, I mean, there's two teams that pulled away, but we've also seen the 49ers lose three straight. We've seen them look very, very bad against the best team in the league. Um, but we've also seen the Ravens lose. The Rams took the Ravens to overtime. You know, the, the Ravens lost to the Colts, you know, at home. So, it's it's one of those things where I think 
And I mean, even, you know, the giants didn't have the injuries they had. I mean, they had a shot and that's why we were still talking about it. Not that long ago. Um, because that's just the league right now. Yeah, definitely. I definitely agree there. And by the way, um, I'm happy for Skoranek and uh, Williams because I'm a huge Notre Dame fan. So okay, I have to watch them while uh, (laughs) while they were at Notre Dame. But um, moving forward with that, what's the fan base's feeling on, and and what's your general consensus on Matt Stafford? Because you said he's playing like the best quarterback in the last few weeks of the NFL. Um, Obviously, there were concerns with the injuries and you know how far more I should say. Uh, he's going to play in the NFL before retiring. Yeah, there were definitely concerns. Um, even I had some of them, but then when I, I found out through somebody, they, they basically were like Stafford's not retiring. He's good to go. As soon as I heard that, I was like, I'm going to take your word for it. Like guy that I trust guy that's giving me some scoops. I'm like, I'm going to take your word for it. So I went on shows where people were like, so Matt Stafford, like, is he, is he like playing this year? Is he going to retire? I mean, that spinal cord contusion, like I think we kind of brushed that under the rug a little bit, but that was kind of a serious injury. Um, and I just, I said the same thing I'm telling you, I'm like, he's going to be fine. Um, you know, I've, I've been told he's going to be fine and I've actually been told he's in the best shape of his life. And he did get hurt uh, week four against the Colts late hit should have been called. He doesn't get past her. He doesn't get a uh, rough in the passer calls. There, I think Nick Mullins has more pat, rough in the passer calls than Matthew Stafford. Um, so, you know, he hurt his hip, had to lead a comeback, uh, not a comeback. They they won, they were winning the entire game. The Colts came back, sent it to overtime, and then he led a, a game-winning drive in overtime with, like, could barely pick himself off the ground. I mean, it was bad. His hip was in pain. Um, I don't think that went away for a while. Then he goes to Dallas... You know, a few weeks later, I'd say about three, four weeks later, and he gets his finger stuck in in a player's helmet. Obviously, you have to understand when you're coming through on the follow through of your throw, you get a finger stuck. That player's not going to just stand there still. <laughs> he's going to move around a little bit, right? Because, I mean, he's a football player. So that finger's going around like crazy because this guy's like, you know, moving his head. Um he still stays in the game because he's the toughest SOB in the league. Um, But then, and I love Sean, but I don't know what Sean McVay was thinking. They score a touchdown and they do a Philly special for the two point conversion Two two out well throws. The two point conversions good, but Stafford gets his finger caught underneath the turf and he's done. Um, so they hold him out against the Packers because they have a bye. They lose that game. Brett Rippon starts. God, that was that was bad. He's um, no longer a Ram. He's a Jet. Yeah, and rightfully so. Um, <laughs> I go in on him too much. I feel bad. I was such a huge fan of his coming out of Boise State. I hope he knows that. Anyway, so uh, coming off the bye, Stafford having that time, two weeks to get ready. Man, he wanted to play. Like, let, let's not get it. It, it, it ain't any uh, load management because like, you know, the NFL is different. The NFL culture is you play. If you're like, your life depends you play on hurt. It. Yeah. You play injured. You know, you don't get this Kawhi Leonard. I'll take a break. I won't play for 12 weeks and no one's going to bat an eye because all they care about is the playoffs. No, no, no. Especially quarterback. If you're an NFL quarterback, and you sit on the sideline because of a finger injury, better be hanging off, better be dangling. And your and your uh, your 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 teammates will look down on you if you don't play, even if you're injured. Yeah, it's just it's a different world. That's why the NFL is superior. But anyway, um, you know, I I think that was huge though, because I you know, say the Rams win that game against the Packers, right? And, and but then you know, a trade off. Stafford starts, they beat the Packers. Stafford re-injures his finger. And it it gets worse and worse and worse. He's not doing what he's doing right now. So I think it was smart. Sean really, he like basically told him, he's like, not playing this week. Trust me. I got a plan. Every Rams fan was thinking, I mean, not, not me and a few others, but three and six, going in the bye, coming out of the bye. You got Seattle 
you know, you, you got the Cardinals, okay. But you got Seattle, you got the Ravens, you got the, you know, Saints, the Browns. It's not going to be easy, right? Um, They might be done. Like this, that might have been the playoff chance, right? Losing to the Packers. Now they're going to get the, uh, you know, the tiebreaker. It's brutal. And they, I mean, hey, they could still miss the playoffs. It's absolutely possible. The Giants could beat them this Sunday. Um, I don't see it, but the Giants could. And if they did, then the Rams won't make the playoffs and most likely. So I just think, you know, kind of looking at that, it's like, would you rather have that win against the Packers and Matthew Stafford not healthy the rest of the year? Or would you take that loss and have Matthew Stafford playing the way he's playing with 14 touchdowns and one pick the last six games? I mean, it's pretty crazy. So, yeah, I mean, to, to get back to your point or you know your question with Stafford, I mean, he is, he's that guy right now. There, there's nobody better currently. I've watched Patrick Mahomes. Matthew Stafford wouldn't be caught dead with some of the, the throws Patrick Mahomes is making. I mean, I'll, I'll say that right now. Mahomes is the best quarterback in the National Football League. He does things that no one else can do. But currently, as of right now, and you can say, oh, well, Stafford has this guy and he has this guy. Yeah, but there's a common denominator. Calvin Johnson's great season the record-breaking season, Stafford. Cooper Cup's triple crown season, Stafford. When Puga Nakua breaks the rookie record for receptions and receiving yards this year, and it, either this Sunday or you know next Sunday, Stafford. I'll take a stab in the dark as well. Kenny Galladay's best season, Stafford. Yeah, exactly. No, you're you're a hundred percent right, and so I, I mean. People can say what they will, you know, oh, stat pad for at it again. I'll tell you right now, the Rams don't run up any score. They, 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 they make it tough on themselves. They don't have a chance to run up the score. They'll be up 28 to seven. And all of a sudden they've let a team in. Now it's 20, 28, 24 late in the game. And you're like, it feels like it's garbage time, but is it still garbage time? You know? And that's the thing. So no, he doesn't, he doesn't run up the score or anything like that. He's just playing damn good football um, in their drives, man. These long 14 play drives that take eight minutes off the clock. Methodical is all get out. I mean, that's really what it's about. You know, you, you want to be able to score touchdowns, not kick short field goals, score touchdowns and wear out the defense and kill clock. That's what they do. And Stafford is the king at that. So that's what we're seeing. Yeah, definitely. And you obviously brought up the offensive line a little bit. Um, you said you would replace Coleman Shelton, but the offensive line is playing better than you expected with Alaric Jackson and all these different guys. Is it better in the passing game or is it better in the running game? Or do you think they excel at both? They excel at both. Um, I, I mean, I do think that they could definitely use a franchise left tackle, but if they stick with Alaric, fine. They, if he wants to keep playing at this level, fine. Um, center, they could definitely use an upgrade. Coleman Shelton is definitely the weakest link, but I don't think he's a bad center. I don't think there are many great centers in the league anymore. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. I think there's about five great centers and the rest are kind of like good to okay. And I think Shelton fits in that. So, yeah, I mean, their offensive line is, is definitely, it's solid. I mean, We'll see what ends up happening. I, I think what people fail to realize, um, and like I could see this being an absolute drubbing by the Rams, but at the same time, I've seen the Giants play defense at home. For whatever reason, at MetLife Stadium, this defense just looks like a different animal. They they look absolutely like juiced. You know, you got A. Sean, you got Dexter Lawrence. You got Ojulari, you got Okereke, um, you know, Thibodeau, obviously I mentioned big fan of Jason Pinnock when I was covering the Jets last year. I don't know why they let him go. That was incredibly stupid. Um, you know, M Xavier McKinney, I think he's underrated, will always be underrated because he missed those first, either missed a, a whole year or two years, uh, his, you know, when he was drafted. Um, but because of the injuries early on in his career, I think they, people kind of forget about him. And Deontay Banks, I mean, we knew he was going to be a stud. So, um, yeah, I, I really I really do think if, if things were a little bit different and, you know, they didn't have all the injuries they had, um, 
Like this team could have done something. Um, they were in the playoffs last year, you know, so it's not, it's not out of the realm of possibility that they could have. And it's kind of funny to me how people are so, you know, they're so sure of themselves about this team being just straight up bad. But like what I've realized is you have to count the injuries. Like, it, I mean, you just, you have to, I, I understand it's a part of the game, but injuries to a starter here and there, that's a part of the game. When you have your entire offensive line get hurt, when you have, you know, your running back getting hurt, you lose your quarterback for most of the year. That's not just football. You're looking at a bad, you know, bad luck season. You're looking at the injury bug and, and teams get that. There are also teams that never get that. So there is some luck involved, you know, and it, it, you know, sometimes it, it matters about where you are on the field. If you have these inexperienced players, especially at offensive line, they're in bad positions. They can get other guys hurt, but I don't think that's the case. I think they've been incredibly unlucky and, you know, I, I think they'll be back next year. I mean, I, the the NFL comes and goes in cycles, and I mean we've seen it. I think there are going to be some good teams that don't make the playoffs. There's a chance the Bengals don't make the playoffs this year. Very very good chance, by the way. And the Bengals are the team before the season started. I said they'd win the Super Bowl. They lost Burrow, so I don't think that anymore. But you know, it, it's a tough league to consistently stay good. I mean, there's always. I think the the rule of thumb is there's at least four teams or six, I think it's six teams actually six teams that made the playoffs last year won't make it the next year. Like every year it seems like there's a bunch of turnover. It's like the Giants are one of those teams. The Rams were one of those teams. They went from the Super Bowl to not making the playoffs the year after. This is the way it is. Football's tough. It's a tough game. Two to three plays change the game. You know, that's really what it comes season. down to. If you're the Jets, you could change your season. Oh my God, I know. And, and the sad thing about that, and I know you obviously, you're like, well, I don't like the Jets. But I think the sad thing about that to me is that we've seen the Jets be competitive with Simeon at quarterback. You know, I, I mean, they had every opportunity to win that game last night. Every yeah. opportunity. I think if Zach Wilson was healthy and he played that game, they might have won. They might have stole that game. Um, the Browns did not want to win that game. I don't know why they came out first half dominated second half. Flacco had like what? Four, 40 yards, 300 in the first half. I mean, yeah, obviously in the first half. Yeah. I mean, more going down. They already didn't have Cooper. I get it, but the jets defense is like super bowl level and uh, their offensive line is atrocious, but also because they got so banged up another New York teams or New Jersey teams, I guess getting banged up. And then, um, you know, I, I think if if Rodgers doesn't go down, kind of same thing with Daniel Jones. I think if both guys didn't go down, they'd be in the playoffs. I think I think the Jets could have won the Super Bowl if Rodgers stayed healthy. Because, I mean, if you gave them Jacoby Brissett this year for the whole season, they're in the playoffs. They are. And that's really what it comes down to. So, you know. No, definitely agree with you there. Heading uh, further into game prep, what are some top matchups, either player versus player or position versus position that you're looking at? Yeah, so I think, I, I don't know who Deontay Banks is going to cover. Um, that's another thing. Like, I don't know who, how you you do things like against this team. Like when when you look at the Rams and you have a Cooper Cup and a Puga Nakua and Demarcus Robinson, two two Atwell, and now Kyron Williams leaking out of the backfield, how the hell do you cover that? You know, I, I just, I, you know, and the thing that's tough about defenses against the Rams is that you can't really play man against this defense, but you also really can't play zone because you have these really intelligent wide receivers that can find that soft spot in the zone and just sit there and they're bigger bodies. They can box out defenders. They can make plays after the catch. They can make guys miss. Cooper Cup is a pain in the ass to bring down. You know, Puka Nakua, like he... That man plays like his life depends on it. Like if he doesn't get 150 yards, the world ends. Like that that's how he plays. And Demarcus Robinson, I mean, man, he's always just he's always open. So it's I don't know, man. I just I think it's like one of those teams that they're so hard to go up against. I think you know, looking at 
Kayvon Thibodeau versus, say, Alaric Jackson, that's a matchup. You know, that's that's it. Because for the Giants to win this game, the Rams are going to have to shoot themselves in the foot. The Giants are going to have to capitalize. But also the Giants are going to have to pressure Stafford. Absolutely. Uh, it really comes down to that. I mean, and, and I got a lot of respect for Wink Martindale. I mean, Wink Martindale came out and said Stafford should be in the MVP race right now. Like, that's a lot of respect anyway. But I've always liked him. And I just, I don't see... I don't see anyone else doing what he's done with what they've been dealt. I mean, the defense isn't amazing talent wise. They got some players, but I think he has them kind of elevated, you know? So I think that's really, that's what it comes down to. I think you got to pressure Stafford. I think you got to focus on cave on Thibodeau, um, whether they decide to chip him all game or whatever. But I mean, the guy, I knew he was going to be a, a star coming out of Oregon. I mean, I, th- I thought it was a no brainer to be honest with you. Um, but yeah, it's definitely guys like that. Ojulari, um, you know, I, and I mean, Dexter Lawrence too, you know, he can come right up the middle and ruin your whole day, you know? And, and I, it, the, the problem is the giants have really struggled against the run. So if, if they can't stop Kyron Williams, this is going to be a long game. Yeah, and that's what I'm scared about, especially with Dexter uh, dealing with the hamstring injury that he's been nursing since, I guess, the Packers game, technically. But he was still a little bit impactful and the trade of Leonard Williams. But um, also, what are some X factors? I guess we'll go one on offense and one on defense for the Rams this Sunday. Well, on offense, I'd be crazy not to say Demarcus Robinson the way he's playing. Um, he scored touchdowns in four straight games, which is his career high is four. So he's tied his career high. Um, if he, if he has 188 more yards in the next two games, he sets his career high for receiving yards. I think just what he's meant to this team the last four or five weeks, uh, Atwell got hurt in the Ravens game, pretty much the beginning of the game. And he had to step up in a big way. Um, then Atwell, you know, gets held out. Um, in the following game against the commanders and he steps up in a big way and you just, you can see the confidence growing the, the uh, not just the confidence he has or the Rams have, but Stafford Stafford trusts to Marcus Robinson. Now um, he has been so key and critical in the red zone. And I think the, the biggest thing for the Rams that, you know, anyone could take advantage of, is if you get them kicking field goals, they got this guy, Lucas Habersick, who I don't trust kicking field goals. Matt Gay had a, like a 95% field goal kicking rate when he was on the Rams. Habersick is struggling. Like he he did well against the, the uh, Ravens, saved his job, and big reason why they cut M- Mason Crosby, which I still think was kind of stupid. Um, but he has not looked great since. So we'll see what ends up happening. But, you know, I think it's really important, obviously, for them to finish those drives with touchdowns. Easier said than done. But I think the X factor there would be Demarcus Robinson to do that. Now on the defensive side, I think there are, there are definitely a few. But, you know, for me, what I would say is when you, you know, you look at the Giants, big big reason or big way that they can win this game um, they're going to need a big game out of Saquon Barkley. They're going to have to get him going on the ground. He's going to have to get going the passing attack. And we'll stick with the ground here. It's why my X factor to me is Kobe Turner. Um, I think Turner, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a big fan of pretty much everyone on the defensive line. Obviously Donald is, you know, well too well known to be an X factor. Um, but I think Kobe Turner is the X factor in this one, because if he can create some uh, backfield penetration and start, you know, really attacking Saquon, take the run game out of it early on and force Tyrod Taylor now to throw, he can collapse that pocket just by rushing from, you know, up front. And when you're collapsing the pocket and now Aaron Donald can, you know, be moved all over the defensive line. They'll move him. They'll, they'll have him use, you know, do some edge reps and things like that. So uh, some stunts, you know, make things chaotic. And um, we've seen Kobe Turner just really turn it on. I mean, he just get, gets better and better each week. The confidence is really growing. 
And I think he's the X factor there. And I think honorable mention would probably be Quentin Lake, who plays slot, um, slot corner star, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, he plays the star role where they call it the where's Waldo role. He's basically all over the defense, um, can cover running backs, can cover wide receivers, can cover tight ends, uh, just really athletic, really, really sound tackler, consistent, um, and he's he's got some ball skills too. If if you uh, you give him a shot, so I, I'd say those are the guys I would say for X factors. And then if you're in a Rams position, but you're looking at the Giants, uh, what are some X factor? Well, one X factor on offense, one X factor on defense for the Giants. If you're looking at an evaluation. Oh yeah. Well, if you've watched the Rams the last few weeks, they've been susceptible to giving up that big play. Um, it's weird they weren't doing it earlier in the year, but there's been a lot of miscommunication lately in the back end of the secondary big plays. And uh, obviously the one guy I'm going to say is my number one receiver from this draft, Jalen Hyatt. Um, Hyatt's been blocking really well this year. Hyatt is somebody that gets open, doesn't get the ball thrown to him. Um, Tyrod needs to get the ball to Hyatt. It's really that simple. Jalen Hyatt is probably the best receiver on the team. People don't realize it, but he probably is. Um, they, I think it's been an abject failure the way that they have not gotten him involved. Um, I, I mean, the guy, mind you, they traded up with the Rams to go and get him. Um, this is somebody that, to me, his route tree was always underrated because of the system he played in. Um, it was always assumed that he couldn't run routes. That's not true. He's one of the fastest receivers from this draft. He's got great ball tracking and just ball skills in general. Um, and like I said, he blocks so he can stay on the field. You know, he can help you in the run game. Jalen Hyatt is the X factor for the Giants. Make no mistake about it. Because on one play, a 14, and I, I, say, I say this because I see it all the time. Rams score a touchdown. They go up 7 nothing. Rams kick a field goal. It's, you know, 10 nothing. Rams kick another field goal. It's 13 nothing. And then the team scores 7. Then a team scores 14. Now all of a sudden the Rams are losing a game that they've dominated. And the way to do that, if you're the Giants, this needs to be the Jalen Hyatt game. There's At this point, you're 5-10. and 10, The season's over. If you're not getting reps to your young wide receiver who could likely be your number one receiver, be a franchise receiver that you end up paying, um, then you're not doing this thing right. You're playing for pride. You're trying to end the season on, on a high note. But you also have to think long term. There's no excuse. And it's why every year we see there's random seventh, six round rookies that start getting reps right around this time of year. This is the time of year where anytime touchdown betters get so pissed because they'll bet on a running back who's starting or they'll bet on a wide receiver who's starting in week 17, who gets the touchdown? The seventh or or even UDFA wide receiver that he hasn't caught one pass all year. Yeah, it's by design. This late in the season, I want to see who I have on the roster, who's going to stick. But also, Hyatt needs reps. I've seen him out there. They don't throw it to him. He's open. He gets open. He just doesn't get the ball. So Tyrod needs to get that, that going um, if they want to beat the Rams. And I think on the other side of the ball, the X factor, um, at least in my estimation, is Ashawn Robinson. Um, Dexter Lawrence is Dexter Lawrence, but Ashawn Robinson is the underrated guy. People talk about Dexter Lawrence, uh, you know, among the top. They don't mention how important Ashawn Robinson is. If they're going to stop Kyron Williams, Ashawn Robinson has to be on his A game. The Rams won the Super Bowl because of a lot of different things. Ashawn Robinson's run defense, just the way he played down the stretch in that playoff run, does not get talked about. He was huge in the, in the Tampa game. He was huge in the Niner game. And he was huge against the Bengals. Joe Mixon could have run wild. He didn't because Ashawn Robinson was there in the trenches. Great run defender. Underrated pass rusher. Doesn't really get any credit for that great run defender. So the key is you take advantage of the weakness of the Rams secondary, not saying the Rams secondary is weak, but I'm saying week in and week out, they've given up a big player too. You take advantage of that. You see what, you know, um, Isaiah likely did 
with the Ravens. You see what Odell did with the Ravens. They could obviously get Darren Waller doing that, but I think it's got to be this. This has to be the Jalen Hyatt game. And then I think on the defensive side, you attack their strength and you try to weaken their strength. And a Sean Robinson has to play the game of his life. And if he does that, and now it's a Kyron Williams, 10 carry 27 yard day. Guess what? Sean McVay ain't going to run the football any longer. And that's a good thing because you don't want the Rams to be balanced. You don't want the Rams to continue to run the football. You don't want them to run the clock down. You want them to have Stafford throwing down the field as great as Stafford's playing. A big reason why I think he's playing so well is because they've balanced out the offense. If he's just throwing all game long, more dropbacks, more of an opportunity to get a sack, more of an opportunity to force a fumble, more of an opportunity to pick it off. Now you get an interception or two. You have a big explosive by Jalen Hyatt. Then you get a huge stop on third down or fourth down. Say they go for it on fourth and one and a Sean stops him. The giants are in the driver's seat to steal the game. And I think that's really what it comes down to. And I know there's probably <laughs> some of your audience probably doesn't even want to win this game because they're five and 10. They have a chance to go five and 11 and then five and 12 and have a really good draft pick. But I'll tell you right now, if I was in the giants position, I already know because I was in the Rams position back when they would win one or two games. I always said, I'll never root against my team. I don't care. And yeah. Okay. The pick matters. Yeah. Yeah. All that. Don't care. I, I mean, when the Rams had a chance to get Andrew Luck, if they lost that game against the Browns, I was still rooting for the Rams over the Browns. And I wanted Luck, but I was like, no. No. Because, you know, you only get 17 of these a year. Guaranteed. If you get to the playoffs, you get 18, 19, 20, whatever. Just enjoy them, you know? And, and I think, obviously, it's tough, too. Especially, you know, the way the Giants season's gone. But, man, when they're at home, though, this is a different animal. They beat the Packers. Let's not forget about that. That Packers team was hot, you know, but yeah, I, I think to, to answer your question, those are the two X factors highly in um, Sean Robinson. Yeah, definitely. And uh, last but not least, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but if you want to further elaborate, where can people find you on social media and what you do? Yeah. And uh, Alex, appreciate you having me again. Uh, I, you know, enjoy being on here. Um, you know, enjoy talking with you. You're a good dude. And um, I like what you do, but um, you guys can follow me at JK Bogan on all social media. Um, you can Google me, Jake Ellen Bogan. If that works for you as well, you'll find a bunch of stuff there. You'll also find a random comedian from Chicago that now lives in LA. That's not me. Um, I like to say I'm funny. I'm not a comedian though. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you can find all that stuff there. And uh, yeah, man, I appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate uh, Jake coming on and giving us the, the Ram side of things and all that sort of good stuff. Be sure to follow him. Check out his work on his YouTube channel, on his Twitter and all that good stuff. But as for this channel slash podcast, like, comment, subscribe to all the good stuff. Turn on post notifications so you know when a live stream pops or drops. Appreciate you all coming back. Um, this will be the last piece of content before 2024 so um with us ending out here we appreciate y'all thank you for getting us to 1k subscribers pretty sure it's going to be soon to 2k um a lot of good stuff happening in 2024 as we'll be going to the senior bowl to check out some of these prospects but uh have a happy new year everyone and we'll see you in 2024